good morning. It's so good to be here. We love this church. We love your pastors. And we had just an extra privilege of being here for Lam Pastor Lamia's ordination. How fun. What, what a nice treat for us. Really, really happy about that. And we just, I just want to say something real quick. Our church has been praying for you guys, you know, ever since you guys got your 90-day notice and all that stuff. And, you know, we were praying. Church of the Nations, Igreja das Nações, we were praying with you. And when God gave you this place, we were so happy. Our church is so excited, you know. We're far away, but we feel like we are part of everything that God's doing. And we really, really believe God has amazing things to do through this church. Amen? So you guys have, you guys have a call, and you guys are going to reach a lot of people here. And we are so excited to be watching and seeing all that God's going to do. Amen? We're excited for you guys. So, so happy. So good to be here. God bless you. Amen. Good morning. Go ahead and show the, the first slide. I, I was sitting uh, uh, together with uh, a young a young guy that we were we were kind of talking like you know kind of pastor uh, uh, friend disciple and we were just kind of talking about the Christian life and the different things that we we go through and and keys to the the, the Christian life. And I started talking to him about, because he was talking about, man, I thought this season was done in my life, and it wasn't done. And I had to go further. And, and, and then I thought it was, oh, now it's finally done. And then it, it just was more of the same thing. Then I thought, oh, this next year is going to be better, and it wasn't. And I was talking to him about, I, I, I started saying to him, you know, there's certain things, there's uh, uh, four or five things, uh, physical things that... that I think represent the Christian life, and I, I think everyone can can understand the spiritual principles that are in the Bible if they do these four or five things. And he said, for example, what's one of them? And I was saying, for example, uh, uh, when we were youth pastors, we got this great idea to do a a summer challenge, something really difficult, and we decided to do a youth event where we we climbed Mount Whitney in one day, where we we tried to climb to the top and and come down. And it was amazing. And so, so climbing a large mountain would be one of those things. And it was like, it was like I remember when we did that, I was climbing thing, and I brought a camera, and I brought uh, an apple, and I bought, brought all this stuff. You know, you try to pack light, you know, you, you re read about what to do. And I remember as I was walking, I'm telling you, that apple was the first thing to go. You know, that was like four ounces. I don't know how, how but it was like, and it was like, and then I was thinking, oh, I don't really need this this here. And I mean, I was ready to leave my camera. You know, I'm like going, man, I spent a bunch of money on that. But it, it was interesting how how th those things weren't heavy until until I started climbing a mountain. And that verse in in Hebrews that talks about laying aside every sin and weight that eagle easily entangles us gave a new meaning because I was climbing this 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 mountain. And it was interesting too when I was when I was climbing, I, I, I could see kind of what I thought was the top of the mountain. I don't know if you've ever climbed a mountain and you're like going, oh man, there it is, the top. And I and and, and we climbed up there and when we get there we go, oh no, over there's the top. And you just keep going and going sometimes. And isn't that like like life? And it was really interesting this this conversation that I ha was having with him, and he he was like he was like, what are some of the other things? You know, four or five other things. And so uh, 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 I said, well, the second thing, I believe, I said, look, I would never say this, definitely never say this in a church setting, is I think uh, just on a personal level, it's not a Bible verse, that everyone before they have children, go ahead, they should get a dog. <laughs> now, it's interesting. <clears throat> Debbie and I, we chose uh, uh, the first dog that we decided to get. We wanted to get something nice and small, and so we got a Rottweiler. And, uh, and he was very small when we got him. It was, it's really interesting how... Uh, um, can I be real with you in this sense? Uh, 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 don't tell the people in Brazil, but you know, it's like, it's like if you can't get a dog to obey you, how are you going to get a kid to obey you? 
Anyways, I, I, I just, people think like that in Brazil. Anyway, they, they don't think like that here. And so I, I remember when we trained our dog and, and the principles of consistency and different, different things, it was just, you know, basic commands. I mean, he wasn't uh, uh, hyper-trained and, and, and all that. Uh, but it was interesting how, how we learned certain, certain aspects through this physical thing. And I started thinking some others. I thought of another thing, second thing, third thing. Go ahead is everyone, I believe, should have a vegetable garden. Everyone. It's amazing how, one, it's like, yeah, you could go buy a tomato at the grocery store, you know, and the tomato's probably even redder than the one you grew. But there's just something about it. If you grew the tomato, it's like it's, it's kind of more awesome, you know. The, the, the big thing that I learned when I had a garden in, uh, from, in Stockton was that if I don't take care of that garden, the weeds grow. And how often I've thought about, even in my personal life, how when I quit taking care of an area of my life, the weeds just start to grow. And how, how it, it's amazing how the fruit or the tomatoes or the, the whatever it is that, that you like to eat from a garden, uh, uh, it has to have purpose. It has to be planted there. But the weeds come uh, uh, for free, right? And it's like, it's like and I, I was just kind of getting more and more inspired. I talked about running a marathon, I talked about the need, uh, the need to uh, uh, do something to, to show you that you, you can run, that life is more of a marathon than a sprint. And so often it's like we get all excited about certain things, but then that, that excitement goes down. And it's like there's something about running a marathon. I haven't run a marathon, run a half marathon uh, uh, in Oakland uh, a few years ago. Uh, since then, I've, I've taken on a different type, type of training. Uh, <laughs> And the last thing and, and kind of the focus that I want to talk about tonight, uh, the, I'm sorry, this morning, is I believe that everyone should plant a fruit tree and keep it producing fruit. There's something very interesting about fruit trees, and, and, and this is what I want to talk about is having a life of fruitfulness. But if, before I get there, I want to show you, it was a bad, it's a bad picture when I was young, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I want, to, want to start with it. This is a picture of me when I was... A, uh, a young boy, not really sure who I'm sitting on the lap of, but uh, my father is, is there on the right, and his mom, my grandma, is there, and there's me with that expression. Now, I, I was even thinking about why I had that expression. I know, for one, uh, it's because I'm wearing a tie. In Brazil, because we planted the church, we, we got that, you know, there's not a lot of benefits as far as, you know, planting a church, but one thing you can do as a senior pastor is you can say that ties are not of God. And so, and so we just kind of prohibited ties kind of on the general thing. At, at a, there's a few events, you know, like a, a funeral that you, you can use them. But other than that, they're pretty well prohibited in our church. And so, but when you're a kid, you just got to do what your parents say, right? And so uh, I experienced several traumas, I mean, beyond uh, uh, wearing ties as a young child. My parents, they, they kind of got on this thing where, where they didn't, you couldn't have sugar anymore. And so all they did is sprinkled wheat germ on everything. You know, it was like very traumatic for me, right? <laughs> and I guess one of the reasons they, 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 they also did this thing, and I just want to kind of use it kind of springboard into what I'm going to be talking about this morning. I, I was a child, I guess I wasn't very regular. Uh, uh, and my parents felt like I, I, I needed some... Um, some uh, organic uh, uh, stimulation to uh, go to the bathroom more, or this and that. And my parents, and one of the great traumas of my life, next slide, is my parents fed me prune juice. <laughs> now, how many of you have ever, ever tasted prune juice? How many of you enjoy prune juice? Okay, exactly, okay? <laughs> exactly. I, uh, it is definitely one of the highest, one of the large traumas of my childhood is my parents made me drink this prune juice. Now, now, I, I wasn't understanding the full process and this and that. They were trying to do something good for me, right? They were trying to help me become more of a regular person, right? And I was an irregular person, I guess, at that, at that time in my life. And, and they, I, I remember they pour this, 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 I don't know, it's bitter. I don't, it's, just, it's just terrible. It's just terrible stuff. And they would sit there and make me drink it. They'd make me drink this prune juice. So this is springboarding into 
what I want to talk about, surviving the pruning process. <laughs> now, we all go through a pruning process. The Bible is very clear on this. And I want to just, I want to focus this morning basically on this, on this passage. We're kind of going to go, keep going back and forth to this, this passage. And I remember the first time that I, I was reading the New Testament for, for myself. And, and I just love the Bible, but I didn't understand certain things. And I had questions that I felt like sometimes no one else had. And that was one of the things that happened here. So I'm reading John 15, and it says, I am the true grapevine, Jesus, and the Father is the gardener. Okay, so far, so good. Got that. He cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. So anything in our lives that does not produce fruit, he cuts off. So I get pruned, right? So I'd, I'm really tracking this up until this point. So, okay, so he's telling me, Make sure every branch produces fruit. Everything in your life is producing fruit or it's going to get cut off. Now, that makes sense, right? Doesn't produce fruit. There's this thing that happens. It's gone. And the something fruit producing is going to happen. But the verse goes on. And so he cuts off every branch, prunes every branch that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that bear fruit. So they produce even more. And I'm thinking, man, this is kind of a messed up deal, right? So, in other words, he cuts off the ones, the, the, the ones that's not bearing fruit. Okay, that's almost like, like getting disciplined or something, right? That, make, that makes sense. But all of a sudden I work really hard and I try to do it right and I actually produce fruit. And the result of that is he cuts it off too. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, your pastor's more of a theologian than I am, but that's kind of what I'm getting here, you know? And it's interesting that the focus is not the cutting off. The focus is, is what the cutting off produces if it's done right. And it's interesting because he cuts that off. He prunes those branches that do bear fruit and the ones that don't. So they will produce even more. And then there's this very interesting uh, finish to this passage. When you produce much fruit... You are my true disciples. Well, I mean, I thought they'll know us by our love, by our love. You know the song, you know, the, they'll know your disciples by your love. They will also know your disciples because you produce much fruit. Isn't that interesting? I, I, I just like, and I started, I started reflecting on this, and I started thinking about this, that this needs to be more of our focus is, is the things that are happening in our life, especially, especially in the pruning process, when we're getting pruned, the focus is, oh, I'm hurting, oh, I, I, my pastor said this, oh, my leader did this, or, or God's, God's taken this from my life. If we focus on that, what it's going to produce is bitterness. But if we focus on what it's going to produce, we get fruitfulness. And it's like, if I start thinking about that, and the things that happen in my life, I will embrace the pruning process instead of hate the pruning process. I will stop complaining about the pruning process, and I will start appreciating the pruning process. And then it says this as the grand finale. It says, this brings great glory to my Father. And it's like, man, be, beyond people will see that we're, uh, we're, we're, we're his true disciples. They will, it will bring great glory to the Father. It was interesting. I was thinking about a time when we, we, were, part, we were part of a pastoral team of a, of a very large church. And, and it, was, it was during a, a really good time in the church's history. And, and when we do communion uh, in Brazil, Brazil, man, we are a, a touchy-feely people. We, we just love on people and... And uh, which has been even a challenge for me because I'm not naturally uh, that, that type of a person. And I remember we were, it was a communion Sunday and the pastor always wanted like 12 couples. And so, and so uh, we only had 11 couples. And so my, the senior pastor called me and he called the youth pastor. We were good friends. And he says, I want you two 
to serve communion. So what we do, what we did, at, you know, on, on that particular Sunday is people would come in and they'd kind of get in a line and we'd serve them the communion and then we'd kind of just give a quick little prayer for them, tell them we love them and this and that, right? And it, it, was, it was really nice and especially nice. I always loved doing it with Debbie. Uh, very, very fun. I enjoyed it. But on this particular Sunday, I don't know where Debbie was, but uh, uh, the, the senior pastor came to me and he says, I want you to do it with the senior pastor. I, I'm sorry, with the youth pastor. And uh, I'm like, go on with him? And it's like, I want you to just go over there and uh, I serve the communion. And, and the way he said it wasn't nice. <laughs> like, like, it wasn't like, hey, do you mind? He wasn't, he wasn't like, uh, you know, I was thinking about this idea. What do you think about it? He just told me to do it. I didn't like it. I, didn't, I, I feel like he did not reflect Jesus in the way he said it. <laughs> Beyond, I, I kind of felt like that was kind of strange, you know? I, I felt awkward. Like, I don't know why I felt awkward, but I felt awkward doing it like that. So here we go. We go up there, and, and we're standing there. And he is the, the youth pastor. If I had a bad attitude, he definitely had a worse one than me, which is always good, right? Because if the, if the lightning bolt comes, the, it always gets the one with the worst attitude. So I, I was kind of in the clear. So we both kind of had an attitude, and we were kind of like there. And so here we're holding the elements, you know. should be a holy moment. should be a very solemn moment. And we're both like this, you know. And it was amazing. No one came into our line. Can you believe that? Just unbelievable. Do you see how the senior pastor made a bad decision? <laughs> Did you see that? It just proved that he made a bad decision because no one wanted to get in our line as we were looking like this. I mean, they're like, I don't want that little guy to pray for me, you know? And all these people are in the line. And uh, the, the youth pastor kind of leans over to me and he goes, he goes, I'm feeling kind of weird, you know? I go, man, me too. And he goes, Let's go sit down. There's no one in our line. Let's go sit down. And I was like, you know when, you know when uh, uh, we, we officially did what he said, right? He didn't say we had to stay there for the whole time, right? The pastor. So we're not like rebellious or anything. We're not, we're not disobeying anything. We did exactly what he said, his horrible decision, and we did it. And, and it didn't work out. You know, God will, God will forgive him. And, uh, and so I was like, yeah, let's sit down. So we sit down, right? So it's all cool. All of a sudden, communion's over. They let everybody go. And the senior pastor makes a beeline for us, right? For me. Uh, I, the, the youth pastor found a great opportunity to go to the bathroom at that time. So I was all alone, you know? And the senior pastor had a very bad attitude. He was physically beat red in his face. And he came up to me. Oh, man, he was so mad. He was so ticked. And he goes, I told you to do that. I know, but... And I was going to j- just explain, because if I only could explain, if I only could explain the, the, how that was a bad decision, and I was actually helping him by even sitting down early. And he did, you know what? He was so insensitive that he did not even allow that. And then he came up with this phrase that just even really made it worse. He goes, how many things do I ask you to do? How many times have I come to you and asked you to do something? He says, hardly ever, right? I go, right. He goes, I asked you to do this. You, You ever have that happen where you got this mixture of, you're so ticked off at this person. But he's kind of right, but he's not 100% right. And if I could only explain myself, he would understand. And just kind of the way he did it, and it's like, it's like it was funny because it kind of turned me into, I, it, it, it bothered me. It was interesting because we had not taken communion yet. And I know this verse is stuff that you just don't take communion when your heart's not right. and That's all I need is more condemnation on top of me, you know. And it's, and it's like, it was the only time in my entire life, entire life, that I didn't take a communion. And it was because I was just, I was just ticked, just ticked at him. It was interesting. Just calm down, calm myself down. And I realized, isn't it funny how those tables just got turned? All he, he had his motives for doing that, and I'm upset at him. 
And because of my bad attitude, my lack of allowing and surviving my pruning process, it caused me to the point to actually do something I've never done in my life, which is really not be, not be in a place spiritually, emotionally, to take the communion. And it was like, what a horrible, horrible thing. I want to talk a little bit about how to survive moments like that because that's what I really have a PhD in because I've been pruned so many times <laughs> in my life so I, and, I, and, and, and I've done it so wrong in some ways. And, 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 but after the years, it's been an amazing process that I've learned and I've learned a few keys. And, 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 and the key key, the biggest key of all is this thing. I understand, oh, I'm going to be really fruitful after this one. So I want to I wanna kind of present four, four questions to you, four questions that we can, take, uh, we can take home and that we can practice for the entire rest of our lives. So let's go on. This is, this is uh, called a pitanga. This is a fruit that we have in Brazil. It is my very favorite fruit in Brazil. It is about the size of a cherry. Cherries can be picked and then they can be sold at the supermarket uh, because uh, just kind of their format and stuff. They're good several days after. Pitangas, no. Pitangas, you have to take them from the tree because they don't, uh, they bruise really quickly and then they're, they're, they're not good. They're kind of a sour, like be a little bit like a sour cherry, sour. It's hard to explain because it's a pitanga, it's not a cherry, okay? So... <laughs> But this is how they grow. And I, when I went to Brazil, our, our first home had a tree, and it had hundreds and hundreds of these things. And we would just go, and we would eat these things. It was just like this amazing, amazing thing that we would do. So I bought a pitanga tree, and I grew that pitanga tree. That pitanga tree grew and started having some really nice leaves on it. And it had one or two blossoms, and one of the, one of the blossoms fell off. And this pitanga tree had one piece of fruit. One, and they're this big, and the seed inside of it is this big, okay? And so, and so I'm watching this thing, and I saw the green fruit, and it's, it's, it's maturing, and this and that. And it's like, I'm scared to death, like a bird's going to come. And I'm wondering, do I need to like put plastic around it or something? And I'm like looking at that. It was interesting because... Uh, 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 a brother came to, came over to uh, to visit us. We were sitting together, uh, Douglas, uh, a friend of John John's, a childhood friend of John John's, and he came over, and we were just talking, and we were I was kind of bringing him into the house, and as we were going there, he goes, "Oh, a pitanga tree! I love pitangas." He takes that one piece of fruit that I and he pops it in his mouth like that, and he ate my pitanga. It was like this, this, this thing in me was just like upset. It's like, what in the world did he just do? He took, he ate my one pitanga, you know? I didn't know. It was funny because I was upset at him, but I was mostly upset at my tree. It was not a true disciple. Did not bear much fruit. It's, it's interesting, you know, sometimes we, uh, 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 several months ago, we, we met with a couple and they were just talking about basically basically explaining how uh, they really can't do anything in the church because they don't have time and they can't do this over here and they can't do this and that. And I was just thinking about that, that, that much fruit thing. We show that we're his disciples. And God's really glorified when we show much fruit. That doesn't mean that we have to have a whole list of things we do at City Life, but it does mean that we are conscientiously looking at these things. So how do we produce more fruit? Go. Number one, first question, do you drink your prune, have you drank, drunk your prune juice this month? <laughs> Has somebody confronted you this month to where you've taken it, or did you react? And I was thinking, I need to, I need to constantly, and I, I, even as I was preparing this, I was thinking, oh yeah, I got prune juice, oh yeah, that conversation with Debbie, yeah, <laughs> two cups. <laughs> It's interesting, you know, we, we've been, we, we were talking about some things and she was just kind of, you know, you know, just kind of saying, hey, you could have done this better. Oh, man, I hate it when she tells me I could have done it better. It's, isn't it easy for people to tell people they could have done it better after they did it? Like, I, I mean, I could have told myself I could have done it better, right? It's like, I need her to tell me that before I do it, and then I do it better, you know? It's like, and it's interesting. It's like, 
It's like, have you drunk your prune juice this, this month? Has somebody, uh, and if nobody's talking to you, you know what could be happening is that we, we're showing people, hey, don't be confronting me on anything. And it's, amazing. It's, it's not because you're so great. And it's not because you're producing so much fruit. Because the Bible says, if you're not producing fruit, you get pruned. And if you produce a whole bunch of fruit, you get pruned too. Next slide. These are lychee, le- how do you call it? Lychee, lychee trees. I bought a lychee, I bought three of them. And I grew them. And I'm telling you folks, I, I thought for sure, I, a lot of stuff in Brazil we get kind of ripped off, you know, and I thought, this guy sold me one fruitless lychee trees, man. I, I waited five years in this thing. And, and I found out that my problem was that I'd never pruned it. So I got out my chainsaw and I took, I, 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 I made up for all the years that I hadn't pruned that baby. It was interesting because even though it was a severe pruning, it was interesting how much all this new growth started coming up. This is my tree, like after, it was about, a, it was about eight months after. Uh, and we just had these things all over, and it was like, it was totally amazing. This is why I say, I think every Christian needs to grow at least one fruit tree to see. And it, they grew so much fruit that I decided not to cut it the next year. So, see that picture on the left? <laughs> the truth of the matter is that's, that's the recent picture that I didn't cut. And the one, the other one is producing much more fruit. It's after the pruning. Go ahead. The second question is, who have you allowed to prune you this month? Who do you have in your life? We all need people in our life that have access to prune. You know what? If you don't know how to ask somebody for that, you know, you don't have to say, well, can you, you what you can do is you can just say, hey, if you ever have some prune juice to, uh, to serve me, I'm, I'm up for it. Just tell somebody that they have the right to just serve you a glass of prune juice. Uh, uh, it's kind of an informal way of allowing for people. But it's like a question that we need to, we need to ask ourselves. I like constantly am asking, who do I allow to prune me? And what information do I give that person to uh, help prune? The third thing is, has your pruning caused you to grow or grumble? And I'll tell you, I, I know a lot more about the, the second part of this than the, than the first part. And I'll tell you, I know that in the last four or five years, I have worked very, very hard. And it's amazing how when I see it as a growth process and I see it as a season and not just uh, this way, and I understand that the people that are truly pruning you in, in a biblical sense, I'm telling you, they love you. How many people have we sat down? I, we were talking about a, a, a situation. We, we sat down and we had it. We just kind of cut a few limbs off. And I, I remember afterwards telling, telling Deb, man, that went so well. That went so well. I was just so happy. And the next week they left the church. <laughs> Didn't go quite as well as I thought uh, that, that it would. It, it's like, and it was interesting because, you know, we, when we talk to, to people, we're not going, hey, who can we hurt today? Oh, yeah. Hey, hey can, we, can we talk about that sensitive area? It's not like we, we wake up in the morning uh, uh, to do that. But what we were doing is we were trying to give keys on how to, how to do better. Go ahead and show the next one. This is a lemon tree that we had in our backyard. And I, uh, I, I wish Debbie wasn't here because it's still a very sensitive subject. Um, I got the same chainsaw out and I did a, a, a prune job on my lemon tree that Debbie loves so much. But what, what had happened is the thing got so stinking huge that you couldn't even see out the window any of our anything. And, and so I, I cut it and it died. <laughs> I killed it. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the two different trees. I'm dead at it. I, I, I wrote this phrase. Go ahead. Uh, spiritual pr- uh, pruning produces fruitfulness or bitterness depending on how the tree processes the intention of the gardener. Let me just run through a few other things just real, really quick. You know, in Stockton, you know, we've got tons of grapes over there. Um, a, a, a grape vine, what ends up happening is the sap ends up going through all the... Uh, all, all, all the branches. And what happens is if there's not pruning, there's only a, an ex, a certain amount of sap that goes everywhere. And if a, a grapevine is not pruned, what it will do is it will be a beautiful bush 
that doesn't produce much fruit. And so what happens is, is when it's pruned, there's all this sap and all this energy that, that has to go out. And so what ends up happening is it, start, it puts all its energy into new growth. Growth and maturity is something that... And have you ever noticed that when you're growing, you're excited about the things of God? And it's like, it's like that's amazing. And then it, go, it, go, it goes in uh, further. Go, go ahead and show the next one and the next one. And then it, just, and it produces fruit. And it produces fruit in the way the gardener wants it to do. And, and it's useful. And the fourth thing is, what needs to be pruned in you today? Uh-oh. Now we're getting, now we're getting uh, really tight. Uh, sometimes you need to prune friendships. I had some bad friends, friends in my, my oh, I remember when I was 18, 19 years old, I had a friend that uh, had, had this car, and, and uh, we just had nothing to do. And I, I remember my friend, he decided, let's go do Bernie's on people's lawns. And he'd back into people's beautiful lawn. And he'd just do a Bernie in there and just ruin their life. You know when you are just like dying of embarrassment of your friend, you hate what's going on, but you're a part of it. And it was like, I remember, I remember hating that. And there was a time where that was right at the time that I started getting involved in church, the youth group. And it was amazing how God, the Holy Spirit, was just working on me. And he was saying, it's time to cut off this friendship here. And I'm telling you, man, this guy, even though he's, it's, not, it's not cool what he was doing, he was a good guy, solid guy, nice guy. You know, really, really liked the guy. But uh, sometimes God even pr- cuts off some people that are, are good in our life. You know, <clears throat> the other thing, uh, other idea that I want to talk about pruning stems from my desire. I, when I, I, it was time for me to buy a car. I, want, I love Camaros. I, I just love Camaro. I don't know why. Just, I just love a Camaro. And I'd save some money. And I bought my first car. Now, I wanted to just show you, that's my first car over there. Yeah. That's the car that I wanted, and I almost, when I say I almost bought it, it, it had all, it was all bondoed, and I mean, it was, it was a sight, but I couldn't even find anything on the internet. It's so horrible, but it was a, a, a Camaro. My parents, it, it, it talked to me, and they were like, man, you should get one. This has really good seat belts and all that kind of stuff. And I ended up doing The Bible says this. Uh, it says, a wise person sees danger, hides itself, but the naive keep going and suffer for it. And just, just kind of hearing my parents and, and this uh, really uh, helped me a lot. So the printing of unwise decisions. Bob Sturge says this, God loves you too much to give you the promotion without the pruning. And it's like, I was just thinking, man, just as we're, we're closing this reset time, I just thought, man, what a timely, timely little quote from the book that just talks about it. Just, we got we to remember, man, he loves us too much. He's not going to give that promotion without the pruning. So when, when that pruning comes, man, that needs to be our focus. Let me give you one last verse to kind of just meditate as we're thinking about this. However it's written, what no eye has seen and no ear has heard and what no human mind has conceived are the things that God's prepared for those of us who love him. And it's like God's got all this stuff prepared for us. And it's like, what do we have to do to get those things that are prepared? Things that are unimaginable. The Bible says our minds can't even imagine how awesome, how great these things are. And I, I just kind of want to kind of toss out this idea that, that those awesome things are, prom- are, are a promotion of where you're at. And he can't give you that promotion without the pruning. And so it's like, I want, I, I, let's all just stand up. I want to pray for you. I want to ask you to kind of, Stretch out your arms, just kind of in a, a position of, of receiving, but also understanding, man, this baby's going to get lopped off here, and this baby's going to get lopped off here, and I'm still going to kind of be worshiping with nubs right here, just, <laughs> just going, God. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, God, for City Life Church. Uh, everything that, that it has done in the city and the world and the, and the influence that it has, even at this size, knowing that, that the Lord is, is, is doing a, a big work, things that even as a church body that we cannot even imagine. I pray your blessing. I pray your pruning. I pray fruitfulness over this congregation, God, that we would be known as a, as, as a light on the hill, that we would be known as people who love unconditionally, that we would be known as people who understand and can receive a pruning in the name of Jesus. Put those peoples in our life that love us enough to prune us. 
in your precious name. Amen.